yeah, today we're going to do a bit of uh, quite a bit of housekeeping type things and setting up language, right? It probably won't be the most exciting lecture, but uh, this language is is very important, right? We have uh, yeah, we have to set up the notions of of sequences and power series and so on because this will be crucial in uh, to do complex analysis, right? And it'll be crucial in the in the following lectures. But yeah, today we have to set up a lot of basic definitions and so on most of which probably we've already seen either from real analysis or from even some of the exercise sessions, but okay, just let me just sort of stream through them very, very quickly. Okay, but the motivate, I mean, even though it's just, you know, setting up language, it's sort of clear that it already has a motivation. Some of the motivation is already clear even before having sort of the language because, right, we were in this, in this uh, sort of quest last, uh, last Tuesday of trying to come up with, with uh, with analytic functions, right? And we said, yeah, the constant function is analytic, the identity is, so any polynomial is, then we took rational functions, right? But these are still like very, very limited class of objects. In particular, they all can be completely characterized by like polynomials, right? They feel extremely algebraic and not really analytic in a sense. And so, and so today we'll, uh, so today we'll, we'll start Right, what was already mentioned on Tuesday is that we're gonna basically set up infinite polynomials, right, power series. And so today we're gonna you know, make the, the language to talk about power series and argue that these are nice analytic functions and so on. Maybe you won't argue this yet, yet today, but we're gonna set up a lot of the language that will allow us to argue this later. Okay, so I assume a lot of this, you've seen different versions of it, but uh, right, so today we'll talk about sequences and series. Okay, is, every, is everything on the technical side working well? Right. Ah, okay, I just noticed here, Rui, when you... Yes, can you check if the sum is actually working? Yeah, Sorry. so when you write, so Rui, when you write here, in the way that you wrote now, you wrote to the people in the waiting room. So you have to, yeah, yeah. on the bottom you have to say, and there's, there's no one there, I think, or there shouldn't be anyone there at the moment. Yes, I. It should be. So. Yeah, like I'm getting. A, uh, sorry, on YouTube. On YouTube, so. yeah, on YouTube, it's telling me that it's working. Now it's on. But maybe. Yeah, but if it's not working for a lot of you, then it's probably best to just. You, can you get sound? And okay, I'm getting some people chatting on YouTube. Okay, and can you get sound when I'm talking against the board? Just make sure it's the right microphone. Yeah, okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, I'm getting, uh, it's fine. Okay. And I'll, I'll keep the Zoom, uh, the Zoom uh, audio on as well so that you have at least two, two audios to uh, some redundancy added. Okay, so sequences and series. I mean, this, this will be uh, you know, a lot of uh, revisiting. But, uh, all right, so let's say we have a sequence, right? Just alpha one all the way to alpha infinity, right? We want to talk about limits of sequences because at the end of the day, we're gonna take analytic functions to be limits of analytic functions, limits of polynomials in a certain sense, right? And so we have to, to talk about limits, right? And the limit, I mean, you all have seen this uh, probably by now, in, in many, many instances. You probably saw it in one-dimensional real analysis and in multi-dimensional real analysis, and now you're seeing it yet again. This, I guess, is in a sense so crucial, right? So what does it mean, right? If we say that the limit is uh, of a sequence is A, right? If for all epsilon, there exists some N zero, right? For any interval around A, you can, you can guarantee that after some time, you'll always be inside that interval, right? That's basically what the limit means. So we can write this nicely mathematically by saying that for all epsilon bigger than zero, there exists some n zero such that if I take an element that's bigger than n zero, then I must be close, uh, I must be at distance small than epsilon. Okay. So what's the, okay, so this, this is the, the, the definition of limit. I mean, and we can talk about limits of functions and all this, we'll, we will in a second. Now, what's, what's the problem with this definition? Okay, let me try to still give some intuition. Right, the problem with this definition is if I give you a sequence, 
right? And I tell you, okay, let's take the limit of this sequence and let's now work with the limit of this sequence as an example of something or as a construction of some object that I want to construct, right? We do this all the time, right? Where there's some object in math that we want to construct for whatever reason, and we construct it as a limit of something, right? And, um, and so if you, right? And so if I want to, if I want to make such a construction, I want to show that the limit exists, that the thing does have a limit, that the sequence has a limit. The issue with this definition is that it seems quite hard to argue that the sequence has a limit if I don't know what the limit is, right? Unless I can exhibit the limit, I can compute this A, this big A, it starts being very hard. How do I show that the sequence has a limit, right? And so if we're trying to construct sort of a new object by taking the limit of something, we almost need to know what the object is before we can prove that this, the sequence converges. Right, and this might seem like a, sort of a silly thing, but this actually is a real difficulty in a way. And so we, one needs to, almost always when we work with limits, we need to be able to argue that a sequence converges, that the limit exists, without actually knowing what the limit is. Because in particular, you would like to say that if you have, you know, if I have a sequence, and then I have another sequence that sort of varies less than the first sequence, then in the, if the first sequence converges, so should the, so should the second one. Right? But how could we argue things like this here? Right? It becomes very, very hard because who knows where the second sequence converges to and so on. Right? We're sort of doomed to fail even tr when trying to argue extremely intuitive things like that. Right? And so for that reason, there's this really nice tool, which is this equivalence between the sequence having a limit in this sense and it being a Cauchy sequence. And the notion of being a Cauchy sequence, you do not need to know what the limit is. Right? I'm sure you've seen this before, but you know, it's such a sort of nice important idea that I feel like maybe it's a good idea to just intuitively explain why it's so important. Right, so a Cauchy sequence is simply like if for all, uh, right, so if for all epsilon zero, there exists, I should say, right, there's like alpha n one to infinity is a Cauchy sequence. If for all epsilon there exists n zero, such that basically I don't, right, I don't ask that it's close to the limit because I don't have that, but I ask that any two elements of the sequence past this n0 have to be at this distance, right, such that for all, now n and m both big or equal than n0, So what this allows me now is, you know, argue convergence by just comparing sequence elements to, to themselves, right? And you can, I mean, right, it's, it's an exercise, a very good exercise to prove that these things are equivalent. But if you think about it, it kind of makes sense, right? Because if after a certain point, the, the, all the sequence elements need to be very close, then they also need to be very close to something else. And so, right, you can, you can if, you, if you know, if you've never done this proof, I highly recommend sitting down and trying to prove that these things are equivalent. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's a little intuitive. Cauchy sequence, right, is equivalent to being convergence. Or having a limit. Okay, right, so this allows us in particular to say, right, we can, we can already say things like this, right, if, we have a sequence bi, bn into infinity and say another sequence, right? And we have that for all, say, n and m. It can even be sufficiently large, but let's say for all n and m, we have that this sort of, this sequence is the contraction of that one, right? Right, so if the sequence sort of varies less than the other one, then, then if, a, if alpha is a limit, so does. Right? Okay. And this will be extremely useful, right? I mean, you've already seen things like the Weierstrass M test and so on. This allows you to potentially argue that something very complicated has a limit by finding something much simpler that just is sort of bigger than it. Okay, so now, now we, we want to talk about sequences actually to talk about, uh, to talk about series, 
Because at the end of the day, what we're going to talk about is power series. So let me write series now. Okay, so series are just, you know, rather than taking a sequence, I'm just taking bigger and bigger sums of things, right? So I'm interested in something like this, right? Because in particular, we're going to allow, this will allow us to talk about infinite polynomials in a way, right? Or part, or a power series, right? I mean, this is just, this is just a sequence, right? When I think of this limit, this is just a sequence of the partial sums. Again, this, I'm sure you've seen this in even multiple classes, but some of this language is so crucial that it's worth just setting up language and notation. Right? And so in particular, right, this converges. So Sn, right? Sn being, uh, uh, being Cauchy right, is a Cauchy sequence. Right, so Sn is a Cauchy sequence if, basically, if and only if, right, if I take there, uh, for every epsilon there exists N0 such that if I take N and M bigger than N0, then, right, then I get that the sums, this, the difference of the partial sums goes, is smaller than epsilon. But the difference of the partial sums is just a bunch of the elements at the, at the end, right? So it's, uh, right? So it's enough to say that for all epsilon, there exists n0 such that for all n bigger than n0 and m bigger than n0, which I'm just going to call it n, n plus p, we have that, you know, a, let's see if I can use the same notation, a n, I, I should say for all p, Okay, so now being a Cauchy sequence is very nice for series because all you have to do is make sure that any leftover sum, that, right? If I take for any epsilon that exists in N0 such that the rest of the sum goes to zero, right? Which feels a lot simpler to do. And in particular, right? In particular, because of this, it's clear that, right? An plus, An plus P, right? By just triangle inequality, Right? By triangle inequality, this is smaller than just taking right? And so and so if I can argue that the sum of the absolute values of the leftover terms goes to zero, then I'm done. Right? And so in particular, we know that if right, if this sequence, this immediately shows that if this sequence converges, then so does right. And so if and so in particular we say that if the sequence of the absolute values, let me just do this, converges, then we say that, right, the sequence A1 plus An plus converges absolutely, or is absolutely convergent is usually the word that's used. It's absolutely convergent. Right, so, okay, and so this will be particularly nice for when dealing with power series, it will turn out, but this is just an, an, a stronger notion of convergence. In which, and in in a way, yeah, in a way we're we're not so good, 
or, or I should say, it's a bit hard. It's often very hard to take into account cancellations, right? A lot of the, a lot, a lot of the difficulties in, in doing estimates and many of the famous open problems and so on, if they involve estimates, it amounts to, to the fact that it's very hard to take into account cancellations, right? So if I want to argue that something like this is convergent so that this is small, if it's not true that this is small, then what must be happening is that some of these terms are positive, some are negative, and there's a lot of cancellations going on, and we really have to, to understand those cancellations. And understanding cancellations is, in general, very, very difficult. And so, by far, it's much easier to deal with things that you don't have to exploit cancellations, because even when you do triangle inequality, it's still okay. Right? And there's, I now don't remember exactly, but there's a famous, like, open problem from you know, many, many years ago that just, just asks to argue with a certain series is convergence where you take, uh, I don't remember exactly, but I can look it up, but you take something that's not convergent in this way, and, but we don't know if it is or not, uh, in, not in an absolute way, and all it has is some kind of sign that makes things rotate a bit and makes cancellations that we have a lot of trouble understanding. So the point being that this might feel like a silly thing to do because we're making things weaker, but we're really not so great at exploiting cancellations. And so most of the time, this is how we argue. Okay. And even when we have to exploit cancellations, oftentimes what we do is we sort of change the problem in a way that then we can do this. Okay, maybe we'll see some examples. Okay, all right, so. Okay, so now we'll talk about functions because really the object we want to construct is functions. So let me erase what I have. But yeah, if there's any question, I mean, either about definitions or you want more intuition on something, please go ahead. I'm trying to, you know, trying hard to give intuition of why some of these definitions make sense because I'm rather convinced that you've seen the definitions and the proofs and so on. You just have to replace reals by complex numbers, but really when you're trying to prove these types of things, the properties you use about the reals are also true in the complex numbers. It's just things like, like uh, triangle inequality on the absolute value and things like this, and then none of this changes. Okay, so sequences of functions. Okay, so let me put, just make clear that it's a function, right? But here I think of, uh, right, the sequence of functions, not of the sequence of numbers at the point x, right? And I can ask if this is convergent, right? Right, and of course, the point is that for functions, we can define convergence in different ways. Okay, so maybe this is worth writing. Okay, and before I even go on, on and define convergence in different ways, there's a natural, so I would say there's two very natural ways of defining convergence. It turns out that maybe the best one is, is a third one. One way is just you can say, well, I mean, if I fix x, these are just numbers. So I can just ask myself if this converges as a sequence of numbers for each x, right? This is the normal notion of what we call pointwise convergence, right? Which I'm sure you've seen before. Another thing you can say is, oh, I mean, I don't really care the fact that they're functions. There's some kind of object Right, I have f1, f2, and so on. There's some object, there's a sequence of something. They just happen not to be numbers. So I can just try and define convergence in, in all I need. If you, if you recall the definition of convergence, all you need is to have a notion of measuring the distance between the function and, uh, the, and the limit of the function. So if you have a notion of distance between functions, then of course you can define convergence and limits and all this. Right, and of course, you can now measure distances between functions in all sorts of ways, right? You can take integral of the different square, you can do all sorts of things, right? 
But the, the approach you're going to take here is not by measuring distances in functions. Turns out that something else is better. And it's the notion of, uh, of uniform convergence. Okay? So let me tell you where I, let me tell you how it fails. First, how normal pointwise convergence fails before uh, trying to convince you that uniform convergence is a good idea. So, right, for all epsilon and all x, this is normal pointwise convergence. There exists n0 such that, right, for all n bigger than n0, we have that f of n x minus f of x, right, which would be the limit. This is smaller than epsilon, right? And we say that f of n converges to f pointwise. Okay, so now what is the problem here? The problem is that for different values of x, it might converge at very, very different speeds, right? So if you take something like, you know, the limit of, say, something silly like, like this, right? For every value, as n goes to infinity, right? Every value of x, you have that uh, for every value of x, of course, as n goes to infinity, the limit is x, right? Right, but the sort of the error, you know, the error that you're incurring is basically, right, is basically something like x over n. And so in order to kill off the error, you need to have n bigger than x. So as x grows and grows, you need, uh, the thing converges slower and slower, right? So in this case, for sure, this n0 needs to depend on x, right? And then you might get, uh, right, with this, you might get nasty things happening. For example, let's say that I take, I mean, I'm sure you've seen many of these examples. Let's say that I take something like x to the 1 over n, right, between, uh, say, in 0, between 0 and 1, right? So if I do something like this, right, at 0, this is... Uh, yeah, so at zero is always, you don't want to, yeah, this is okay, right? At zero is always zero, right? At one is always one. And now as I take, as I take n larger and larger, right, I'm going to get this closer and closer to one, right? So I'm getting this closer, closer to one, but you know, you're going to get things like this, right? And, and as, n goes to, as n grows and grows, this line starts getting closer and closer, but this one is still at zero. And it's not so hard to see that in the limit, you'll get something, right, that is even discontinuous, right? And you'll, this is for sure not a nice way of taking a limit. It's exactly because the closer you get to zero, the further you need to go on n in order to make it... Uh, Right, in order to make the in order to, to be epsilon close, right? And so here you see very clearly that you need to take n depending on x. And here you see that if you're not careful and if you have a convert like some kind of uh, a limit that holds in that way, that you might even end up with things that are discontinuous, right? Okay, so it's important the notion of uniform convergence. Right, and why is this important? Uh, right, so the notion of uniform convergence is just that things like this don't happen. And you can pick the same n0 for all x. Right, so for all epsilon bigger than zero, there exists an n0 such that for all x and for all n bigger than n0, we have this. Right, so f n goes to f uniformly if this happens. Okay, and now you get very nice uh, like theorems or propositions, right? That if f n are continuous functions, so nasty things like this do not happen. If uh, f uh, right, if f n are continuous functions, uh, then um, then and 
Fn converges to F uniformly, right? I mean, you've seen all this in real analysis. Then uh, F is continuous. Okay. Right in here, yeah, I realized that on my notes, I had made a much simpler example. And then that's why my picture was upside down. I had just made the example of X to the N, right? between zero and one, which just reverses the picture and is maybe a simpler example, but all of this is the same, same phenomenon. Okay, all right, so, uh, okay, so how do you prove uh, something like this, right? It's uh, very, very easy. I mean, I won't prove it here, but I'll just draw the picture, right? Let's say we have some kind of limit. Let's say that this is F, and we have some kind of Fn, right, that's approximating F. Right? Proof by picture. Of course, it's not a real proof. You need to work it out if you want to prove it. But I'm just trying to convince you that this is the case. Right? And what you want to prove, let's say that there's some x0 here. And you want to prove that if your x nearby, right? if your x is near x0, in the sense that this is very close, the values of f also need to be close. Right? This is what continuity is about, which is not true here. Right? But how do you show something like this? Right? I mean, you have to do some algebra, but by, the, by looking at the picture, you can see exactly what algebra you need to do. Right? All you need to, what you know is that the function above is continuous, and you know it's coming to it very fast. And so all you need to know, to, you have a, a way to compare this point with this point. Right, because they are on the same x and there's some uniform convergence. So you know this needs to be close to this one. You also know how to compare this one with this one for the same reason. And then you know how to compare these two because of continuity of Fn. Right, and so if you go, and so all you have to say is, well, this point is very close to this point, which is very close to this point, which is very close to this point, and thus the two pink points are very close. And if you go see at the proof, you set up something with epsilon ever over three and so on is exactly because of this, because I'm making a jump of three things. Okay, all right, so this so is a, right? One should always try to draw a picture before working out the algebra, because usually the picture tells you exactly what algebra you need to work out. Okay, so yeah, we, st we still have a bit more of, uh, of real analysis to do. I'm sorry for the, for the throwback lecture, but it's important to just make sure that this is, uh, you know, that we're all on the same page on this. I didn't do this right at the beginning exactly to start with things that are a bit more uh, exciting. But we do need to do this at some point and so. Okay, so because of, um, let's see, where is my, uh. so because of, uh, you know, this notion, because in particular because of the Cauchy sequences and the fact that if the sequence is bigger in the sense that these, uh, these uh, partial sums are bigger and that the leftover partial sums are bigger, then if, if that converges and the other one converges, it allows us in particular to do something that, if you think about it, it's even more powerful than just using some sequences to bound other sequences, which is that now if we have a function, if we have series of functions, we can actually use series of just numbers to, and to bound the series of functions, right? So we can, convergence of functions seems like something much more complicated, but we can actually use convergence of sequences to argue convergence of functions, right? As long as the sequence sort of is bigger in the Cauchy sense than the function at any point. Right, so okay, so let me do this. So in particular, if you have something like this, right, the series of functions. Right, we say that, yeah, so let me write this way, that a sequence, or a series, sorry, is a, ma is a major end. I 
maybe I should write this with a bit better end writing in case uh, it's not completely obvious. For some n and and um, an n large enough, right? It doesn't need to be. What happens for small n doesn't matter. Okay, so right. If this happens, that it's not so hard to see if you go look in the Cauchy sequences that if a converges, then Fn's also need to converge. Moreover, maybe that's not quite as obvious, but I won't prove it. But it's, it will also be very easy to believe, and that probably you've seen this in real analysis already, that because we're using the same sequence for all x's, then actually this will give uniform convergence. All right, so if a1 Notice, right? These are all, right, M is just a positive, right? M needs to be a positive, of course. And so ANs are also positive reals. And so this, this is, if it's convergence, it's also absolutely convergent, it's the same. If it's convergence, oh, I, sorry, sometimes I forget to add that. Then, Right, is uniformly convergent and absolutely convergent and everything. Okay. Uniformly and absolutely convergent. Okay, it doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, okay, good. So what else? Ah, this is called, this has a name. This is so useful that it has a name. It's called the Weierstrass M, M test. Maybe you've already even used it in the exercise classes. The reason why this is so useful is that most of this, the series we're going to consider are actually power series. And in power series, you're going to get some term times z to some power. And so it'll be relatively easy to imagine what it is that you need to, what is a, me a measurement for it. And so you just, you know, when you understand power series, you basically just use this again and again and again. Okay. Okay, so power series. Okay, I'll try to go through it very, very quickly. Okay, so power series will be things like this. The nice thing is that, right, we know that if we stop at some point, right, it's a polynomial, it'll be nice, analytic, everything. And so this will allow us to take limits, effectively limits of analytic functions in a way that we understand them quite well and will allow us to, to build new analytic functions and reason about analytic functions in a very powerful way. Okay, of course, you can have... Right, of course, you can do instead things like, right, you can take things like a n z minus some, uh, what notation do they use for this? Some z zero, right? You can center the polynomial somewhere else. It makes no difference, of course, right? 
So we're just going to take z0 equals 0 because there's no difference whatsoever. It just makes it easier to both write and read. OK, so example. OK, let's take a very, uh, very canonical example. I'd be probably the simplest possible one. Well, the simplest possible one would be to make the all the a's equal 0, or all the a's equal 0 after a while, but then we wouldn't really have anything infinite. So that's not a very interesting example. The simplest possible interesting example is just setting all the a's to 1. Right? We can set all the ways to 1 and see what happens. OK, so let's do that. OK, so we can try to understand what this sequence is, right? And so now we can look at partial sums, right? So what is the value of the partial sum? This is known as a geometric series. <clears throat> we know exactly how to compute this, right? I mean, how do you compute this? You take this expression, multiply by z. What it makes is just everything move one to the right. If you subtract the two, almost everything cancels out, and then you just uh, close the expressions. All right, and you get something like this. OK, what does this tell me? All right, for, right, for z, OK, for z with absolute value smaller than 1, then for sure this converges, right? And in fact, for z smaller than 1, the series 1 plus z plus z squared and so on plus z to the n, right, the limit of this will just be, right, if z is smaller than 1, then z to the n, as n goes to infinity, will go to 0. So I just get 1 over 1 minus z. OK, if z is bigger or equal than 1, then of course the series diverges. OK. Now. How do you, maybe this is a good place to, to make just a comment. How do you argue the series diverges? You know, if z is a, is a real, like 2, then it's very easy to argue that the series diverges. Right? Because if it's 2, then, well, you're doing 1 plus 2 plus 4 and so on and so forth. I mean, you're just adding more and more. There's no way this is ever going to go anywhere else but to infinity. But if instead I take, say, minus 1 or i or something like this, it's not obvious at all, right? If I take i, if I take minus 1, say I get 1, minus 1, plus 1, minus 1, plus 1, it's not going to infinity, right? It's, and so if I take a complex number, how can I argue that this won't, uh, that this won't converge anywhere? Okay. Let me give you uh, 10 seconds to write something on the chat here. Yeah. So if you think, okay, so if you think in terms of the Cauchy sequences and so on, of course, for this to converge, you need that each of the summons goes to zero, right? If the summons don't, if the, each of the summons are not a, a sequence converging to zero, then of course it doesn't, uh, it doesn't, right? And someone basically wrote that just now, right? That you need this, the terms to go to zero, and so if z is bigger than one or even one, this won't happen. Right, and so, or, or let's say, let, let's not, let's not think about the one for now. But if z, if the norm of z is bigger than one, that that won't happen, and so for sure we'll run into trouble. Right, even though there may be cancellations from the fact that, right, you're not just always adding stuff in the same direction. You might sometimes be coming back and going forward. They, your jumps are growing and growing, so for sure we'll diverge. Okay. Okay. So it turns out that this behavior that we're seeing here happens essentially always, right? And it's because, you know, powers in this way, they sort of grow or decrease so fast that if the number, if basically your, your, your argument is smaller than in a way that makes the limit of this go to zero, then basically the series are almost will always converge, and when it doesn't, will always diverge. Now, exactly at the critical place, so exactly at 1, in general, there's more interesting things going on, right? Not, not really in this one, but in other ones, there may be interesting things going on because you might be going to 0 but not quite 
fast enough like a polynomial or things like this. But this dichotomy, if you are strictly smaller than the place where sort of the terms end up being bounded away or at zero, or you're strictly above that, you're always going to be either convergent or divergent. And so because of this, there's this very natural definition of a radius of convergence, right? Because sequences will always converge in a certain, circ in a certain ball and not in, in outside the ball, okay? And so this is an important, I mean, this is a theorem that I'll, I won't prove, but I'll say a few words about how the proof goes and I, I welcome you to just try, you know, sit down and do it because it's a good exercise. And some of these, some of these things is, right, I, I want to give you some intuition of how they go and why they are true and why they're important, but going through all the epsilon and deltas and the arguments is almost more useful if you sit down and try to do it yourself because when you watch someone else do it, there may be certain difficulties that you don't see until you try it yourself. So it's a good thing to just try it yourself and I'll try to give you as much intuition of both the importance and the reason why it's true. Okay, so this theorem is due to a bell. Okay, so if you take a power series, a n, z n, there exists an r, right? And this r will be some, it might be infinity, it might be zero, right? We call this the radius of convergence. Um, where the following is true. So the series is um, converges absolutely for, oh, sorry, for the norm of Z smaller than R. If you wanted, now you might ask, okay, I want things to converge uniformly as well. <laughs> There's an issue though, because at when, the, when you're exactly at the circle R, right, when you're exactly at this circle of radius R, things may get a little complicated. And so it may be in particular, as you get closer and closer to the circle, it may converge slower and slower. And so for this reason, you can't quite argue that, but. The, if we want to argue that the convergence is uniform, all we have to do is make an in, a circle inside that one, right? And say I'm convergent because if I'm inside that one, I don't have this issue of approaching closer and closer. And this way I can argue uniform convergence very easily. So in particular for, right, for any row smaller than R, the series converges also, converges also uniformly in in this inside this this smaller circle and i mean the speed at which converges will depend on rho but once you fix rho it's uniform right two if z is smaller than r then the terms are unbounded okay this is in the book exactly written this way so the series diverges Okay, exactly, exactly what's going on here, right? There'll be the place in which the terms are gonna go up. Okay, and three, right, in, if Z is smaller than R, then the sum in the series is analytic. Analytic. Sorry, let me. Sorry that I'm taking two extra minutes, but let me just finish writing this theorem. Is analytic, and the derivative uh, and derivative it can be done termwise. Okay, sorry for the board organization, but just since we're, I, I'm already uh, over time, I don't want to take more time to erase the board. So it can be done uh, termwise. And has the same radius of convergence. Uh, 
Okay, so how, okay, so I'm one minute over time. Give me just one more minute just to finish the thought. So two, I have two, I wanna convince you in a minute of two things. One, why do we care about this? Two, how do we prove it? And uh, yeah, I think those are mostly it. So how do we prove it? So let me go back here, proof. Right, how do we prove uh, this statement? Basically, you take, right? It's exactly this notion that you wanna understand exactly when is it that the terms start growing or decreasing. And so if you work out what that is, you just have to take one R to be the limit of, right? Because this is the number such that when you, when you take it to the power N, starts looking like one over a n, and so makes the terms be smaller than one, and this is make sure that they're not, uh, they're not growing. Right now, you know, this, there's absolutely no reason for a n's to have a limit, right, at all, right? You've seen like things like, you know, like, uh, uh, I mean, there's many, many sequences in which the a n's don't have limit. I could have instead of doing one plus z plus z squared, could have done one minus plus minus plus and so on. And so we need to take the limb soup but otherwise it's all the same, right? And so you take this R and you just prove one of these things one by one, right? And I mean, it's, it's relatively easy and it's a very good exercise to just try and do it, right? The one that takes a little more work is number three, but again, it's just, you just have to carry the, the, the epsilon delta type arguments, right? Now, why should we care? Well, I guess two ways. One, it tells us a lot, right? If you believe power series are important and it tells us when they converge and when they don't, and in particular, it tells us that the region of convergence is actually quite simple. Inside a, a circle, it converges. Outside the circle, it doesn't. And then in the circle is anyone's game. We'll see that there's a lot of interesting stuff happening in the circle, and in general, it becomes very, very difficult. Very intuitively, again, inside the circle, they converge sort of even in absolute value. Outside the circle, they just diverge. In the circle itself is where all this cancellation stuff starts to, to show up. And so math there gets a lot, a lot harder. And in particular, this already allows us to build new analytic functions, right? Because if I come up with a power series, if I take at least inside this circle, then I already have analytic functions that I didn't know before were analytic. And why is it so easy to argue here that they're analytic? I know exactly what the derivative is. I know it's the term-wise derivative. So I can just work out the derivative and all I need to prove is that those limits coincide, right? So it gives me a tool of showing, right? So I highly recommend proving this. Right, it will take you a few minutes. And, and this already allows us to build new analytic functions. Okay, so next time we're gonna start with, uh, finally go and explore the exponential, the trigonometric functions, Euler's formula and all of this. Sorry for the extra minutes, but uh, if I had stayed in the middle of this theorem, then it would have been harder to, it would have taken way longer next week to do it. Okay, so I'll, I'm around for a bit longer if there's questions. And then I can 